Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Gary Gill. I'm the Deputy Director for Environmental Health in the State Department of Health. And uh, you are here tonight to have an update on the Red Hill fuel tank situation, the most recent spill uh, in January, and uh, a little bit of the history of the facility. Uh, we will have some time after this meeting to try and answer those questions. But the focus of tonight's meeting is first Red Hill, second Red Hill, and third Red Hill. So with that, um, there's a lot of people to introduce in the room. I see that we have some elected officials and some neighborhood board members. Uh, and uh, we obviously have some uh, commission members from uh, state boards and commissions and a lot of uh, Navy employees. And I have a lot of my staff here. And if I introduced them all, it would be 7.30 before we got started. So um, I'm going to uh, violate protocol and not introduce anybody. Uh, to get right down to the, uh, the heart of the meeting, if that's okay. So unless there are any burning questions right now, what you're going to have is a short presentation from me, uh, from the Department of Health. Uh, you'll have a short presentation from our friends from the Environmental Protection Agency, who are working with the Department of Health on this issue. And we'll have a presentation from the uh, U.S. Navy, from their perspective, and then we'll have some time for questions. Okay? So I think we're all on board with that. And again, um, helping me is Joanna Sito from our drinking water um, program. And what I hope to do here is I'll run through these quickly because I think most people probably got the story from the boards already. But let me just um, clarify. What are you pointing at me? I can. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> so. Um, this is uh, a presentation um, to provide some basic background information on the Red Hill um, facility and what our response uh, to the most recent uh, leak of that facility has been uh, since January. So, I don't know if the lights are going to help us with that, but this is um, a cutaway of the 20 fuel tanks buried into the ridge line at Red Hill. Uh, just to orient you, uh, here is the Halava Correctional Center, uh, Red Hill Elementary, Kaiser Hospital is down over here. Uh, this is, I think, Coast Guard housing in here. This is the Halava Industrial Facility, and the quarry is here. Um, so these are tanks that were built um, by the Navy uh, beginning in 1940. Um, 20 of them, uh, I will say, uh, an engineering marvel. Uh, nothing like it that we know of in the world. Uh, and each of these uh, tanks um, receives fuel that's pumped up from Pearl Harbor, and then it can uh, roll down through the piping system to fuel uh, ships in Pearl Harbor by gravity. Um, but these tanks have been in place, constructed in place. Uh, I'll let the Navy discuss more detail about that. Uh, but again, began construction in 1940 or so and uh, were put into uh, operation during World War uh, II. And they've been in continuous operation since then. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale, each tank here is about 250 feet high and 100 feet across. And I'm told by my staff that that's more or less to scale the Aloha Tower. Uh, it gives you an just an impression of how large these things are. Each one holds 12.6 uh, million gallons. Uh, and again, uh, they, were, they were constructed in, in top secrecy during World War II. So um, before, before I get into the, the actual recent release in January, I wanted to make sure that people were aware that this has been an ongoing situation. The Navy and the Department of Health have been working collaboratively on this facility for more than a decade. Um, in the 1990s, uh, laws were passed that uh, provided oversight by the EPA and the Department of Health over these tanks. They were previously un unregulated or even top secret. Um, but since that time, there's a lot of work that's gone on 
to um, respond to what we have known before January, before this most recent release, what we have known to be historical releases from these tanks. Uh, so we have an ongoing working relationship, a positive relationship with the Navy, responding to previous historic releases. Uh, but this, in January 13, is the newest uh, and the only report of a release that we've received in the past couple decades. Um, it was reported first as a suspected release, um, estimated at 12,000 gallons. Uh, we set up a unified command to respond. This is what you normally do if there's a spill, an oil spill or something. You set up a unified command system uh, for an emergency response. Uh, if any of you have been through this uh, with the military or civil defense or firefighters, uh, it's a common system of um, command so that uh, all the different agencies can work together to respond uh, without tripping over each other and work efficiently. We did that. The Navy and Department of Health did that um, together. Um, uh, since then, uh, and, and we notified the Board of Water Supply, um, and the, the first thing that you do when you suspect that there's going to be a release is you, you remove the product so that the leak stops. And so the Navy immediately did that, drained Tank 5 uh, so that nothing else would leak from it. Um, this is just to give you a perspective. Um, these rows of, of tanks uh, go up in the mountainside, and this is the access tunnel uh, that connects all of those 20 tanks. And this tunnel, again, leads all the way down to Pearl Harbor. And uh, there's little side alcoves, if you will, with the uh, piping that goes in here to the bottom of those tanks that are on either side of this access tunnel. This is get out of the way here. This um, is a picture of some staining, some uh, petroleum product, uh, probably mixed with some groundwater, that is uh, beneath these uh, pipes at the bottom of the tanks. And this was an ind indication back in January that uh, Tank 5 um, may have been leaking. And this is a tank that was out of commission. It had been drained. It was being repaired and restored to be put back into operation. It had just recently been filled. Uh, and then signs that a leak had taken place were discovered by the Navy and reported to the Department of Health. So, um, I, I should say that that initial um, 12,000 to 20,000, uh, the Navy settled on a number of 27,000 gallons. That's a calculated number. Nobody knows for sure what it is, but that's their best estimate of what may have spilled um, from that tank. Uh, we noticed as well uh, that the, p the vapor levels that we monitor beneath those tanks uh, was elevated. Um, and um, again, the, uh, the actual release was confirmed here at 27,000 gallons. So um, there's a number of uh, Department of Health programs that are involved in this. Anytime there's an emergency response, it might be molasses, if you remember that. Um, it could be a chemical spill or an oil spill. Our hazard evaluation emergency response um, office um, takes on the responsibility of overseeing the disaster and the cleanup. So the HERE office was first on the scene, but uh, we also have the solid and hazardous waste branch and our safe drinking water branch. These are two programs within the Department of Health that also have jurisdiction over this issue. So underground storage tanks are, uh, and, uh, are regulated by our Department of Health program, um, and our drinking water is protected by another Department of Health program. And all three of these agencies, uh, or programs within the Department of Health, are working on this, this release. So um, the, the first thing that happens uh, after a release, uh, a response action, is remediation. Uh, so you can think of it as sort of a three-part uh, response. First is the emergency response where you stop the leak from happening. The second thing you do is you start to clean up what spilled. And then the third thing that typically you do is remediation uh, or restoration and prevention. Right? So uh, we're still on the remediation phase right now. 
um, and our underground storage tank program and our drinking water programs are now in the lead. Um, so uh, the first thing that we, of course, needed to determine was whether any contamination had reached our drinking water. And the answer is your drinking water remains safe. Uh, there is no uh, evidence that any petroleum from this most recent spill in January or from any previous spill over the past 70 years has reached the Board of Water Supply wells. Uh, the Board of Water Supply wells, uh, Halava Shaft is about a mile north, uh, northwest of these facilities, and the Moanalua well is a little bit more than a, a mile south of the Red Hill facility. The closest well um, to the Red Hill tank farm is the Red Hill shaft that serves the Navy's drinking water system. Um, that Navy system is regulated by the Department of Health and um, there is evidence in prior reports prior to this spill that very, very low levels of naphthalene, almost undetectable but found, uh, were found in that Navy uh, drinking water well. So it's an indication that not a large amount of contamination has reached drinking water in the Navy system, but there could be some there. I think that's all I need to say about that. Uh, again, here's uh, just an orientation. Uh, if you look from the sky, these 20 tanks are here. Um, the Halava shaft is all the way across Halava Valley, um, just above, uh, this is H3, so it's on the far side or the north side of H3. If you come down here under Kaiser Hospital uh, at the Moana Lua Road interchange here, this is the Board of Water Supply drinking water well, um, a little bit more than a mile, almost due south. And uh, I believe this is the, uh, the Red Hill uh, shaft, the Navy's drinking water system. And so this is, this is the one that showed uh, very small traces of naphthalene in the drinking water. This is a, a cutaway, it's an exaggerated view, uh, so um, these things look longer than they actually are, but it indicates that this is the ridge top. Here's the lineup of the tanks. Here's the groundwater. So uh, the distance between the bottom of these tanks, you know, through the, the lower access tunnel is about 80 feet to 100 feet until it reaches groundwater. And we know uh, from previous work with the Navy where we've drilled a number of monitoring wells down through this access tunnel into the groundwater, we do know that there's contamination from previous spills prior to January, uh, contamination of the, drink of the groundwater uh, in this location. Typically, um, when an underground storage tank is installed uh, at your neighborhood gas station, a number of rules and regulations um, that from EPA and the state of Hawaii apply, and uh, it requires double lining of tanks. Uh, so uh, this is a big upgrade from what was done when we were all kids, uh, which you could just stick a steel tank or a fiberglass tank in the ground, and uh, over 20 years it was pretty much guaranteed to crack and leak. So there's a, a been a whole effort nationally to upgrade the technology of uh, your, your underground um, storage tanks. Um, now, that, th those requirements, those standards do not apply at Red Hill. Um, Red Hill is a field-constructed, one-off um, facility. Uh, it is not required under the current law to have double lining and leak detection and a number of things that your gas station would require. Uh, and that, this is just an illustration of, a, uh, this is on the mainland, you can tell because the sky's not blue, but uh, this is an installation of a, a typical uh, 10,000 gallon underground storage tank. They're, they come prefabricated and, you know, plunked in the ground. Go ahead, Jara. Um, so again, just to outline, I won't read through these, but this is um, uh, typically the 10 things that any storage, underground storage tank would need. Um, but uh, because these are field constructed tanks, uh, these only these f uh, four yellow items are what legally applies to these Red Hill tanks. Um, 
I think I'm going to kind of skip through this. We've already talked about it. I want to make sure we have time for other speakers. Um, so uh, this is a good place to stop. So um, again, um, since the January release, there's been a, a long list of, of activities that the Navy and the Department of Health have been working on. Uh, <clears throat> In, including venting the tank. Uh, if you can imagine, this is a, a huge 250-foot tall vessel. Even though you drain the fuel out of it, there's likely still going to be uh, fumes or vapors in there. So you have to, to purge the tank in order to get people into it. The Navy had to get um, their contractors into it. Um, they, can they can discuss this in more detail. But uh, as I mentioned, the contractor had just rehabilitated the tank. And so if there were a leak, it could be a defect in that contractor's work. And so that contractor had to go back in um, in order to maintain that legal relationship, that contractual relationship between the Navy and their contractor, uh, and had to identify whether there, in fact, was a potential defect, defect in workmanship. Um, so it's taken us a while to get through that, um, uh, but that's an indication of how long it may have taken for the Navy to go in and inspect the tanks um, and ultimately confirm that there were a number of holes in the tank. Um, over a period of a couple weeks, uh, the initial report of finding three holes extended to seven and then 15, and now we're at 17 uh, potential leaks that were found in tank number five. Uh, and that's where we are today. So um, what, what remains to be done and what is the relationship between the Navy and the Department of Health and the EPA in this? Um, we need to uh, identify the location and extent of the contamination that exists in the groundwater. We know it's down there. We don't know exactly how much or where it is or where it may be traveling to. So that is job, uh, a very important job for us to do. And uh, the Navy has already begun contracting to drill two additional monitoring wells to identify uh, whether the contamination that, again, pre-existed this most recent spill um, is uh, moving in any direction near our drinking water supplies. Um, the, the other thing that remains to be done is to see whether it's possible to remove any of that free product, any of that up to 27,000 gallons of fuel that spilled out of the tank, perhaps through the concrete barrier, perhaps into the bedrock, and perhaps working its way down again into the groundwater, whether there's any that we can be removed before it reaches down there. So that, that work remains to be done as well. Uh, I talked about the additional monitoring wells. Um, uh, there's another concern, uh, as I mentioned, that that lower access tunnel goes right past a, the Navy's drinking water well. So we're very concerned, and the Navy is as well. They've done a number of work a uh, number of jobs already to protect the drinking water source in case there might have been a leak or could be a leak in the future into the, into the tunnel system that could get into the drinking water. So they have additional work to do to protect the drinking water source from any contamination that might come from a broken pipe or some kind of catastrophic release. I'm done? Oh, wow. So um, before I... I pass this over to EPA. I just wanted to say one thing because um, it's, it's been raised to me and, uh, and it's a concern that I share. I've tried to explain to you folks today that we have a strong working relationship with the Navy that goes back well before this January spill. What you may have heard from me saying in public or on the radio is that it boils down in my mind to two basic options. Right. We believe that in the Department of Health that the highest possible degree of protection should be placed in these tanks if these tanks are going to remain in use by the Navy. This is a tall order. It's never been done. There's nothing like this in the world 
we don't know, as I, I don't know, as I stand here before you, technologically, how these tanks could be double-lined and what kind of leak detection that would approximate or, or mimic what is done on your neighborhood gas station. We don't know how to do that. But I believe the Department of Health and the EPA working with the Navy believe it can be done and we're trying to figure out how to do it. I don't want to imply ever that the Navy has been deficient in their managing of this facility. It's 70 years old, but it's received professional management in my experience, in the, at least in the past decade or so. If you go there, it's ship shape, it's freshly painted, it's professionally managed, they have electronic controls. They're doing a good job with the technology that they have. Yet we've had this spill. And yet we've had some questions about how large the spill is and, you know, or did it even happen? And so I would like to see, and the Department of Health is working with the EPA and the Navy to see how best we can upgrade these tanks. Can we double line them? Can we add new technology? Can we provide greater protection for our drinking water if these tanks are going to remain in place? And the Navy will ad address that, you know, the national security issues of why they think these tanks need to remain in, in place. Uh, and that's a fair question. Um, but I, I want to assure you that in, in the recent dealings with the Navy, they have been responsible and responsive to our uh, concerns. And we are working on, where it is right now, we're working on a comprehensive agreement that will lay out what needs to be done, by when it needs to be done, how it needs to be done. And this is an agreement that we hope we will secure between the state, the EPA, and the Navy at the highest levels. And then it will be us working together to get those resources, the federal resources, to do those improvements and to uh, implement that agreement. So that's where we are right now. The bottom line takeaway is we have a long way to go. Your ex expectation should be this is going to be years of work. Uh, it's going to be shorter term going after any free product that might exist, shorter term going after identifying where the plume is and where it may be moving, but longer term in terms of making uh, full upgrades or changes of technology or additional technology uh, in the whole uh, tank farm system. So I hope I haven't confused you with that. Um, so we have some oral questions we'll entertain. I'd like to ask people if you, just so everybody can hear, if you could come forward and use the microphone. Um, so we have one question here from a member of the press. You're welcome to be here. Thank you. Um, why were the two tanks taken out of service? And um, also looking at the inspection reports of the tanks, um, when some of them have been taken offline, um, they've shown hundreds of pukas and defects. And um, how do you reconcile saying that they're in really good shape with the defects that you're finding? So I'll, I'll take the first part of that, and Scott, if you want to help me with the second part. Okay. So the two tanks that are currently permanently out of service, um, we maintain levels of fuel at Red Hill based on the U.S. Pacific Command uh, O plans, or, you know, war plans. And the current war plans prescribe a level that does not require those two tanks. So if we need additional capacity at some point in the future based on those plans, then we would inspect and renovate those two tanks and put them back into service. Okay, so the second part. Thanks, Scott. And, and thank you, ma'am. And you're right. That's what we're doing when we open these tanks is looking for the pukas, uh, you know, trying to find uh, what those defects are. Uh, most of the defects that, uh, that we're finding are, are gouges. Uh, they might be... Uh, uh, most is, is wall thickness uh, of, the, of the metal. Uh, it's not uh, uh, streaming oil. Oil is not going out of it. And we're assured of that because of the tank tightness testing that we're doing on a two-year cycle. So I, I'm certain that Tank 5 was not leaking uh, prior to taking it out of service in 2009 because three months prior to it, 
uh, we actually did the tank tightness testing and it passed, it wasn't leaking. Uh, so in and of itself, uh, even though you have these anomalies, uh, it, it, you're going to have that normal reaction to steel as it ages. So that in and of itself, when we find these areas for upgrades, we're usually uh, just increasing the wall thickness of the tank. Okay. So in the original construction of the tanks back in the 40s, why did they not use stainless steel instead of regular steel? I don't know. Um, but, but, I mean, it begs, it begs a, a, a good point. Uh, these tanks are, uh, how thick is the steel? Quarter inch steel. Uh, so quarter inch steel from the onset. There is uh, between two and four feet of concrete around that encases uh, these tanks. And so uh, there's, in, in, if you looked at the tank, the designers you know, really thought into the future as they built these tanks and, and put the concrete around them, you know, to prevent, you know, a catastrophic event from happening and to essentially build at the time uh, their best guess at what sort of secondary containment might look like. And so they did think, uh, they did think forward. I don't know why they didn't use stainless steel, um, but, you know, they were doing this at a at breakneck speed with a lot of other distractions going on around them. So, um, but uh, good, good question. Right. Okay. So th this is a this is a, an excellent question. As we're looking forward, as to what kind of upgrade or improvement, what kind of technology exists to double line the tank or to put some kind of um, coating on them, perhaps. Uh, so that's something that I know we've all been looking at, and I uh, don't know if anybody would like to address, you know, what the existing technology is, or in fact, what kind of coating, in part, may have been placed on any of these tanks. Looks like Scott, you're getting this one. That's an outstanding question, and uh, if you saw out on the, uh, the slide deck uh, that was presented uh, uh, by Captain Williamson, you'll see that uh, we hope in November to actually award a contract that addresses uh, these types of technologies. Uh, I think, uh, uh, kind of speaking off the cuff here, but what we've asked uh, this statement of work within this contract to address is what is in the realm of the possible, both on the exterior uh, of the steel of these tanks and what's on the interior. And I will tell you, it, it, in my brain, I think of rubber coatings. I think of advanced epoxy, epoxies. Uh, but we're going to take this outside the box, get the experts in industry, and figure out the best solution set uh, to what, what's feasible for our installation. Okay. Further questions?